Today we are starting a, a new teaching series that I have called The Power of Three. So excited. Marie, you're excited about that. The Power of Three. And for those that enjoy uh, music, particularly those of a certain age, the famous hip-hop band De La Soul. Does anyone know them? Three is the magic number, everyone. Uh, for any mathematicians amongst us, and according to Pythagoras, three is the noblest of all digits. Uh, it's the only number to equal the sum of all the terms below it. The rule of three suggests that when things come in threes, uh, they are funnier, they are more memorable, they're more satisfying. Two of something is interesting, but three of something is compelling. Three represents the beginning of a pattern. Three is a trend setter. Time is divided into three, past, present, and future. You can see where I'm going with this. Uh, biblically, the number three represents divine wholeness, completeness, and perfection. The book of Proverbs in the Bible tells us that a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And in Scripture, words and phrases that are repeated three times have particular significance and powerful meaning. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The Holy Trinity, three in one. So over these next three Sundays, we're going to be looking at defining moments in the Gospels, in the eyewitnesses' accounts of Jesus where Jesus says just three words, and it changes everything. If you have a Bible today, we're going to look at Matthew's Gospel, and we're in Matthew chapter 4, and we're looking at the calling of the first disciples. And Jesus says these three words that change the lives of three simple fishermen, these businessmen, and yet their transformed lives went on to transform the lives of so many hundreds and thousands of people 2,000 years later. So let's read together Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We pray, Lord Jesus, that today you would give us open hearts to receive your word and to put it into practice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just three quick things that I want to draw out of this passage tonight where Jesus calls these first disciples. The first is that his call is personal. It's personal in that in this invitation, Jesus doesn't shout to the masses. He doesn't shout to the crowd from a distance, but he sees these two sets of brothers, these simple fishermen and yet local businessmen, James and John and Simon, Peter and Andrew, and he speaks to them directly, personally, and he says, come, follow me. Come, follow me. That was my experience. I had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home. And I sort of went to church, and I did the kind of things that Christian families do. But it was at that moment, I was 11 years old, and I particularly remember that call to me, come follow me from Jesus, those personal words. There was the moment where I said, well, Jesus, I'm going to follow you for myself. I'm going to put my hand in your hand. I want you to come and be the guide for my life. And his call is personal to these disciples and he doesn't call them to follow an ideology he doesn't call them to follow a particular politi political manifesto but he calls them to himself this is a calling to a person he says come follow me 
being disciples of Jesus. Discipleship flows out of a place of relationship with and proximity to the person of Jesus. Come follow me. I don't know if you're ever in the supermarket and you're looking for that one particular item. Uh, I often go shopping and I've got my list and there's always something on the bottom of the list that I can never find. They always seem to move it in Asda or Sainsbury's. For me, it always seems to be the red Thai curry paste. Uh, well, it just kind of moves around the shop. And there's that moment where I'm thinking, well, I don't know where it is. I've given up. I've tried looking for it myself. And I see the shop assistant. And I say, hey, I wonder, can you just help me? I'm looking for Thai red curry paste. If they say, oh, it's aisle 14, my heart sinks. I'm like, oh, I've tried aisle 14. I just can't find it. But if they say, I know exactly what you need. Come follow me. I'm like, absolutely. (laughs) And I just follow. And they're just taking me there. Now, Jesus is not just like a shop assistant. But he does say, I am the way. Come follow me. That's what Jesus does in our lives. And it's a sobering thought that we can identify with Christianity. We can even call ourselves Christians. We can be part of a community of people like this. And yet we can go through life not following Jesus. Being a disciple of Jesus means being in relationship with him. My question tonight is, how is that relationship going for you? Is it going well? Maybe you just met Jesus and your relationship with him is fizzing and popping and it's fresh and it's alive. Maybe you've been in that relationship with Jesus for a very long time. Maybe you've learned those ways of just being with him, enjoying being in his presence. Things are still going strong and they're flourishing. But maybe you've been in that relationship with Jesus and things need a little bit of attention. You need to lift the bonnet and go, maybe I need to do a bit of work on my relationship with him. Sometimes Emily and I like to do a little bit of people watching. Does anyone else do that? Maybe if you're in a restaurant or a cafe, I find it's always easy to spot the people who are on a first date. And you can always tell the first dates that are going well and the first dates that are not going so well. When it's going well, there's eye contact. There's maybe a little bit of connection. There's proximity in the relationship. Or maybe sometimes when we're in that cafe or restaurant, we might see an older couple or friends together. And you can just tell in that moment that they've, they've got this strength of connection. There's like this bond. There's this, this relationship that's there between them. They don't even really have to be saying much. But you know that there's this love for one another. You also know when those friendships or those relationships are a little bit frosty. Things aren't being said. Eye contact is lost. For any relationship to thrive and to flourish, it needs time. It needs intentionality. And of course, it's the same with our relationship with Jesus. And we need to nurture our relationship with him. And the way that we do that is through prayer, through reading his word, through practicing those different spiritual disciplines through engaging in the community of his church, through serving one another. Jesus says those three words to us tonight personally. Come, follow me. Don't get caught up in the trappings of church. Follow him. Follow him in your everyday moments. Follow him despite your sorrows or your joys. Follow him In spite of your questions, whatever you might be facing at this time, put your hand in his hands. He says, come, follow me. His calling is personal. Secondly, his calling is powerful. This was just a regular day at work for these new disciples. It says that they were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. And Jesus comes along, he's walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he sees them. And he says, come, follow me. 
and seemingly without hesitation, they follow. They just go for it. They take that bold, courageous step of following him. Why would they do that? We might read this and sort of look at it through hindsight and just go, well, of course they would. It was Jesus. It was his magnetism. It was his attractional qualities. Of course they would just leave everything and follow him. But we know that although these brothers, they would have known of Jesus at this point, they wouldn't have come to know him as the Son of God. We read later in the Gospels that so often they were struggling to believe and trust in who he really was. At this time, it's probably more likely that they just saw him as just another rabbi. And at that time, it was, uh, it, it was a tradition. If you were to follow the rabbi, often you would go up to the rabbi and you would ask them, can I, can I be your student? Can I be your pupil? Will you train me? And it was so unlikely that they would say, yes, you had to be an exceptional student. Even more unlikely that the rabbi would come to you and say, come, follow me. That only happened in exceptional circumstances. The word for those students is Talmudim, which in Hebrew means disciple. And to be a disciple was not so much to know more information or to get more content But it was to become like the teacher, to become like the rabbi. And so here is Jesus calling these first disciples. And he's calling us today to become like him. Not not just to know more about him, to, to become like him. And it's an invitation of grace. He comes to us. That's the nature of God. That's the incarnation that we celebrate annually at Christmas. That the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's called you and he chooses you. John 15 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Wherever you are today, Jesus meets you exactly where you're at, in your everyday, in your boat, in your work, in your family, in your relationships. He says, come and follow me. And these words of Jesus, they have power, they have authority to mobilize these disciples to action. It says that immediately they followed him. At once, you know, it strikes me they weren't reluctant. They weren't apathetic. They weren't hesitant. They were just all in and they held nothing back. What does that look like for us? What are the things that we're holding on to that prevent us fully from following Jesus, fully from being his disciples? They gave everything. Later on in the Gospels, in in Matthew chapter 19, Peter says, we've left everything to follow you. Where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never heard these words before of Jesus saying, come follow me. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus before. I want to encourage you, don't delay. Don't think, oh, maybe when I'm older, Or maybe when this happens in my life, take that opportunity to follow Jesus, to trust him. His call is personal. His call is powerful. And finally, his call is purposeful. He says to these disciples, come follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Wholehearted discipleship involves a commitment to four different areas. Firstly, to the Word of God, to the Bible. How is my life being transformed through the truth of God's Word? Am I taking time to read it, to feed on His Word? Secondly, a commitment to the people of God. How am I engaged in the church? Do I just come and go? Or am I committed through loving service uh, into the church? Thirdly, a commitment to the Spirit of God. Am I continually being filled with and led 
by the Holy Spirit? Are we allowing the Spirit of God to shape us, to change and transform us? Do you know, that's why often in our, our, our services, and we really want to encourage this in the groups, that's why we give time to worship. We believe that he inhabits the praises of his people. When we worship, he's there amongst us. The Spirit of God does a work in us. He softens our hearts. So wholehearted discipleship is a commitment to the Word of God, the people of God, the Spirit of God, and finally to the mission of God. Jesus gives those disciples the great commission to go into all the world, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. In other words, we as his disciples are to be disciple makers. And often, of course, we do that through the church. We have different activities. We have different programs. But it's more than that. Each one of us individually, wherever God has placed us, we are to make disciples of other people. We are to witness to his love, to what he's done in our lives to invite people to come and experience what we ourselves have found. It might be to the one. It might be to a multitude. Uh, some of you, I know, would uh, have met uh, Linz and Lucy West, who are a part of the church here. Linz does amazing mission work. He's sort of traveling. I know he's in Norway today. Uh, just reaching out to young people, to school kids, just seeing hundreds and hundreds of people coming to faith, who wouldn't ordinarily come to church. They've recently done a mission in Bath. 600 people off the back of that school's mission coming to do Alpha. This world desperately needs Jesus. They desperately need us to be his hands and feet. And all of us whether we're called to full-time ministry or to mission like Paul or to like Linz or those who are called to work for the church, all of us, whether it's that or whether we're out in the world being ministers of the gospel, we all have a part to play in his mission, to play our part. Maybe it's that God's called you into government. We need Christians in government at this time and in politics making legislation, making policy that would honor him. Maybe you're in the creative industries, reflecting the brilliance of God's creativity. Maybe you're in uh, the charity sector. Maybe you're in business. Maybe you've got the opportunity to make money, to grow and to build the kingdom of God. Wherever God has positioned you, he's positioned you there for a purpose. In Acts Chapter 17, verse 6. These few disciples, they were accused of turning the whole world upside down. Just a few disciples. Far fewer than here, are here tonight. What might God want to do through us to bring change and transformation? To turn the world upside down for his glory. That's what we are called to do. His call is personal, it's powerful, and it's purposeful. What is God calling you to do today? He says, come, follow me. Maybe it's to start that journey of wholehearted discipleship for the first time. Maybe it's to take stock again of our own discipleship. Maybe it's to rewire again our patterns of, of prayer or reading the Bible or spiritual disciplines. Maybe they were things that we used to do and we've, we've put pause on for whatever reason. What is it that might be holding us back? Maybe our busyness, maybe our fear, maybe other things have got in the way of our relationship with him. Today, Jesus says, come, follow me. Amen.